Good evening. Good evening. This might work. Well, welcome everyone to our third lecture in the class of 1972 Great Issues in Energy, Climate, and Society series titled Financing a Clean Energy Transition in Africa and the Global South with Andre de Reiter. I'm Jeff Parker, Interim Faculty Director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society, Executive Director of the Master of Engineering Management Program, and a faculty member at there. Um, so lots of hats there, but they actually do interact nicely. Um, so before I tell you a little bit about Andre, I want to take a moment on behalf of the Irving Institute to just express our gratitude to the class of 1972 for making this series possible. With their 50th anniversary gift, an endowed lecture series focused on addressing today's great issues in energy, environment, climate, and sustainability, the class of 1972 has given Dartmouth and the Irving Institute a really great new way to explore the complexities and lessons of this pivotal time in history. Thank you so much, class of 72, for your generosity and for your support of Dartmouth and the Irving Institute. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I'd also like to take a moment to thank our event co-sponsors, the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and Social Sciences, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Tuck Center for Business, Government, and Society, and the Revers Center for Energy, Sustainability, and Innovation at Tuck. And a special thank you goes to Jonathan Silverthorne, uh, Jonathan Silverthorne, Executive Director at the Rivers Center for helping us bring Andre to campus. Now to our guest. It's a great honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Andre De Reiter. Andre is currently Senior Fellow at the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs. Until February 2023, he was the Chief Executive of ESCOM Holdings Group, South Africa's state-owned electricity company that provides 95% of South Africa's electricity and about half of the electricity used across Africa. Under Andre's leadership, ESCOM operated 30 power stations, including coal, nuclear, hydro, pump storage, and gas-fired stations, as well as a wind farm. A seasoned executive with a career spanning 34 years, Andre has a wealth of experience in both South Africa and internationally managing diverse portfolios in energy business, including coal, oil, chemical, and gas. However, he's committed to enabling responsible yet accelerated decarbonization of the energy industry and other sectors, and has played a key role in conceptualizing and negotiating the 8.5 billion SA Just Energy Transition Facility announced at COP26, a firm believer in a business approach to solving problems. Andre developed a number of innovative structures to enable the acceleration of the rollout of renewable technologies. Tonight, we'll share his perspectives on the challenges and critically the opportunities of building renewables and other projects in countries with high capital costs and how we can engineer a better future. Please join me in offering a welcome to our guest tonight, Andre. Right, uh, thanks very much. I hope this uh, works properly. Oh, I feel that it really works. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the honor of um, inviting me to address you, and uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, and I look forward to a really interesting debate with all of you later on about this very difficult topic, which I don't pretend to have solutions to, but I would really like to uh, engage with you and also challenge you uh, about how we address this, this really important and burning issue. So let's start with, and uh, of course, this thing about deciding not to move for some reason. Uh, moving earlier on, is there a magic key somewhere? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's clear it's the key design. I don't know if it's where is it? Maybe it wants to 
Okay, all right. So this this um, satellite picture, of course, is is very well known, uh, and it points out that Africa really is the dark continent, particularly at night, and it points out to the inequality that exists in Africa, and this and this matters. Why does it matter? It matters particularly because of three reasons that I would posit. The first one is climate justice. Climate justice is, is topical, uh, and some people disagree that there is such a thing as climate justice. But if you look at the amount of carbon emitted over uh, the past two and a half centuries or so, and you compare that to what is being emitted in Africa, then the fact that Africa is on a very low uh, energy trajectory at the moment with 900 million people in sub-Saharan Africa being in energy poverty, that is a cause for concern. Secondly, there is the real um, likelihood of significant climate migration as you um, as, as the world experiences the impacts of climate change it's worthwhile noting that Africa is twice as likely to be impacted by climate change as the more temperate global north so what will happen is the current crisis that, that is a political hot potato not only in the United States but also in Europe that is likely to become significantly more challenging going forward because there are 900 million people that are going to be impacted much more severely by climate change which was not caused by greenhouse gas emissions that are affecting those people the third reason relates to this particular dark spot here and that's the congo river basin now the congo is a very interesting country it's a, it's a very large country uh, from east to west is as far as from london to moscow just to put that into perspective but africa is a, is a large place and the congo river basin rainforest is the most effective carbon sink in the world uh, in fact, it's the only remaining rainforest that is a net carbon sink. The, the Amazon is just about neutral. Indonesia and the Asian rainforest areas, in fact, now negative from a greenhouse gas perspective. But the Congo rainforest still absorbs about 30% of the US's annual greenhouse gas emissions. So it is something that is worth protecting and worth looking after and when you think about the impact that uh, development has had on the amazon as well as in indonesia the question is how are we going to develop africa in a way that allows us to maintain this very important planetary asset and that is the question that um, is particularly acute when you look at the phenomenon of energy poverty. People in Africa don't have access to electricity by and large, as is indicated by this map. The dark red means less than 75 percent of people don't have access to electricity. And this definition of access to electricity is, is very loosely defined. It means that you have access to enough electricity to uh, switch on one light, one LED light, and charge a mobile phone. So that's a very undemanding definition of electricity access. And you can see there that for most of sub Saharan Africa, uh, there simply is no access to electricity, um, compounded by the fact that there is no residual infrastructure. Uh, in other words, there's no electricity grid. And one of the ways that we can think about resolving this is to look at mobile telephony, where Africa decided to leapfrog the stage of fixed line telephony, which is on the decline globally, 
and it goes straight to mobile telephony and has a very high percentage now of penetration of mobile telephony. And similarly, I think renewable energy and distributed generation offers the opportunity to leapfrog Africa into addressing energy poverty without waiting for the 10 years that it takes on average in the US, by the way, to permit a high voltage transmission line. So if it takes the US 10 years to do so, you can imagine that in an undeveloped country without significant institutional capacity, it will take even longer. Now, the picture is not getting better because all over the world, access to electricity is improved and it's getting better, except in Africa. In Africa, it's actually getting worse. So we are clearly not getting to grips with this important issue. Uh, and we, we are not even starting to make inroads into addressing energy poverty. And energy poverty is something that is very soul-destroying for people who are afflicted by it. Um, who in this audience has ever made a fire using dry cow dung? Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's more than I normally get. <laughs> so that's impressive. Um, my experience with it is that it's, um, it's not very smelly, um, but it's very smoky. It's, it's, uh, so it's not a great feel. But for some people, that's the only fuel they've got. And how do they collect the cow dung? How do they collect the lumps of coal that they find to burn? They walk around, and typically this is a job done by children who should be either playing or learning. Uh, they are being forced to collect firewood um, and cow dung and lumps of coal that have fallen off trains. So, Poor people are the least likely to have access to electricity, and they are more likely to remain poor if they stay unconnected. So around one in seven people, so about 1.1 billion people, don't have access to electricity. And three billion cook with something that is not regarded as a clean fuel. Now, in the US, people are concerned about cooking with natural gas. Uh, if natural gas were available in Africa, that would be a huge boom, a huge improvement from uh, the current situation. So if you look at some African countries in Liberia, for example, only 2% of people have access to electricity. Only 2%, imagine that. And we take it for granted. And where electricity is available, it's very unreliable. Uh, I come from South Africa, where we have this phenomenon called load shedding, which means that you have rotational blackouts, uh, sometimes for as long as 12 hours a day. Now, this is a huge inconvenience for households, but imagine running an economy, right? Imagine running a manufacturing plant when you don't have access to electricity for 12 hours a day. It becomes an impossibility, so the prospects for economic growth and job creation as a result of energy poverty are very, very significant. But even when it is available, it's very expensive. So instead of costing around 10 US cents per kilowatt hour, it can cost between 20 and 50 cents per kilowatt hour because generating electricity using a diesel fire generator costs a lot. For those of you who've been to Lagos will know that when dusk falls, you can hear the, the Lagos Symphony starting up, all the generators running across the city. Now, this is not the way that the world should be working, certainly not in the 21st century. And there are issues of governance, and there are issues of institutional capacity, of course, that affect the role of electricity. But I want to focus on uh, one aspect in particular, which I'll come to in a moment. But let's just look at the case for assisting Africa in embarking on a growth trajectory that is low carbon. If 900 people in sub-Saharan Africa started to live like Americans, then we would be, as a planet, in desperate trouble very, very quickly. 
the U.S. currently uh, consumes about three times what or emits about three times the global average. And that global average is brought down by the developing world. So if the developing world decides that we want to live like Americans and we want to have the same level of energy consumption, where currently uh, Africa, the typical African consumes less electricity per year than an American refrigerator, then you can clearly see that we are, if we want to address climate change, we have to find a solution to enabling energy poverty to be addressed without creating a far, far bigger problem and in fact accelerating climate change to the point where we will be completely unsustainable. Now, those of you who studied climate science will know this picture quite well. Uh, this means that, in short, we are, as a planet, in pretty serious trouble. Our carbon budget, in other words, the amount of carbon that we can still emit to get to our target of a 1.5 degree increase in average global temperatures is nearly depleted. That blue circle, that outer circle, that's the amount that we have left that we can still emit. And it's not a lot. It is not a lot. You can see that emissions from fossil fuel sources account for the bulk of it. But also, very importantly, look at the impact of land use change. So if, due to energy poverty, people in the Congo decide to embark on a campaign of deforestation, which they are doing at the moment for lack of a better alternative, what's going to happen? Emissions from deforestation are going to increase. So again, there's a, there's a significant imperative for us to address this problem. Now, last year was the highest level of greenhouse gas emissions ever. The International Energy Agency tries to take a sanguine view of this. They say, look, it's, it's, we, are, we are topping out, we are peaking, and next year will look better. Uh, well, maybe. I sincerely hope they are right. Um, I'm not sure that they are right. But I can tell you that if we do not solve the problem of providing clean energy access to developing countries, we will definitely uh, not live within our carbon budget means. So who should be reducing their emissions? So let's, uh, let's do a bit of naming and shaming if we don't mind. Uh, look at the US, uh, blown its budget completely. So the US and Europe, and the United Kingdom, because they now have to be named separately since Brexit. Uh, they have since 1750 consumed just about the entire carbon budget that is available for humanity to avoid uh, catastrophic climate change. And even a country like China, which today, on an instantaneous basis, is the top emitter in the world still hasn't used up its per capita carbon budget. So it's easy to point the finger at COP negotiations at China and say, oh, you need to reduce your carbon emissions. But bear in mind that the Chinese actually have not as yet fully developed their economy. So there is a strong case to be made from an equity perspective that those countries who have consumed the most of the carbon budget have some sort of a moral duty to transfer funds to developing countries to enable them to grow their economies and to decarbonize without emitting more greenhouse gases. And this was the fundamental premise underpinning the Kyoto Protocol, uh, this, this transfer of money. The, the problem is with that is that it's a great idea. But imagine a presidential election in the United States where you run on the platform of saying, chaps, vote for me. I am going to transfer a trillion dollars over the course of my term to uh, developing countries. 
what are the chances of that platform being a success, even in Vermont? <laughs> it, it will not work. It will not work. So even though morally, philosophically, it might be a great argument, practically, it just won't happen. So we have to find another solution and just to appeal to the inherent goodness of the developed world to transfer wealth. One um, aspect that I would like to draw your attention to, just as an aside, is Brazil's carbon budget. Look at Brazil, in spite of the Amazon rainforest, look at how much their land use change, which essentially is deforestation, has impacted their greenhouse gas emissions. So this means that Brazil today is, in spite of the fact that they've got this tremendous asset called the Amazon, they are essentially living in a balanced budget situation and they cannot be relied on to bail out the rest of the world. So the latest political changes in Brazil being particularly important and hopefully uh, slowing down this rate of land use change. Now, since I have been living in the US, um, one of the interesting phenomena that I've seen is that there's an, there's an advertisement, or should I say advertisement, for everything, uh, for pharmaceuticals, but also for lawyers. And the American Petroleum Institute has this wonderful ad where they say, eight out of every 10 Americans say that we need oil and gas. Uh, but what is that opinion based on? Is it based on fact? Is it based on any sort of scientific or economic analysis? And I think not. Because if you look at this, this statement that is made, if we stop burning fossil fuels, we will kill our economy. Well, let's, let's look at the facts here. On a trade-weighted basis, so that includes items that you import that were manufactured in China on your behalf. Uh, so the adjustment is made uh, for carbon emissions in China for goods that are consumed in the United States. Um, it's clear that you can significantly increase your GDP per capita while slowing down your rate of emissions. And the US has achieved this. So there's an opportunity here uh, in the US. And to some extent, you can say, well, a lot of this is due to the fact that coal was priced out of the market by low cost shale gas. So the US was really fortunate in developing these huge reserves of shale gas. So maybe the US is, is an exception. So let's look at another country. Let's look at China. Look at China, even though it has increased its carbon emissions. Yes, granted. Uh, but bear in mind what I said about the carbon budget. But look at their GDP per capita and look at how they have been able to engineer amazing economic growth while slowing down the rate at which they are um, depending on coal in particular. Now, I, I also lived for a while in China, and I must say that if, if I look at the rate at which China is rolling out renewable energy at this point in time, I think they're going to surprise the world. They are going to overtake the developing, or the developed world rather, in the rollout of renewable energy, and they're going to be decarbonizing far more quickly than the 2060 target that President Xi has set. Uh, the Chinese have this amazing ability that if they set their minds to it, they, they tend to make things happen. So watch this space. I think uh, this curve is going to start tapering off very soon. So let's look at, at, at another developing country, South Africa, my, my country. And uh, even there, you can see that uh, a highly carbon intensive economy can decarbonize and maintain at least a stable GDP per capita. And this is the situation that has prevailed. So for a coal dependent economy, South Africa is one and a half times uh, more carbon intensive than China uh, per unit of GDP um, on a per capita basis. 
and also uh, twice as carbon intensive as the global average. So for a carbon intensive country like this to maintain uh, some semblance of economic growth, not nearly as much as it should be, while significantly reducing its uh, carbon emissions, tells a story. Brazil is, again, the exception, but I would suggest that this is because Brazil uh, is already 87% dependent on renewable energy, predominantly hydro, some of it uh, based on uh, bagasse, a uh, byproduct of the sugarcane process, ethanol, and so forth. So where you have a very high uh, penetration of renewable energy, that equation starts to break down. But the, the poster child really is Germany. Uh, look at how the Germans, with some very, very forceful policy interventions, have increased their GDP per capita uh, by 40% from the baseline at the same time as reducing the carbon emissions per capita by 40%. So that's that's the art of the possible. So uh, when people tell you this uh, this lie that, that fossil fuels are essential for economic growth, the data simply don't support. Uh, and, and I would like to see data that support the contention of the fossil fuel lobby that you need to burn uh, fossil in order to grow your economy. We'll, we'll come to some reasons why a very modest uh, role still needs to be played for natural gas in particular in developing countries. Uh, so let's, let's put a pin in that thought. Let's not be completely dogmatic on the other side of the equation, but certainly uh, economic growth is quite possible. And in doing so, you, you are solving for this energy trilemma. So energy security, does, is energy available? Energy equity, is it affordable? Is it accessible? And then environmental sustainability. Now, it's very interesting. If you look at the World Energy Council's report on this energy trilemma, you see uh, the developed world right at the top of the score. But doing well on energy security and energy equity, but doing far less well on environmental sustainability. But when you page down to the lowest scores, all the poor countries, and pretty much all of them are in Africa, they score exceptionally badly on all of those metrics. So energy is not available. It is not predictable. It is not cheap. And where it is available, it is typically environmentally unfriendly. And this is, again, another way of looking at the challenge that we, that we face, that we need to solve. So let's, let's uh, delve a little bit into the economics of energy. So levelized cost is um, a way of comparing different forms of electricity. Now, levelized cost is not a great metric, admittedly. There are many criticisms that can be brought against it, uh, particularly because of the fact that renewable energy self-dispatches into the grid. So it generates electricity when the sun shines and when the wind blows, uh, except if you invest substantially in storage or if you overinvest in renewable energy so that you have a portfolio effect, but that comes at a cost. But this is a this is a good way to compare the costs over the life of an energy project um, in a in a way that makes a fair amount of sense. Now I want to only focus on two of these uh, energy forms, and that's. Uh, uh, the first one is natural gas. So this, this obviously being a pie chart does not reflect the uh, absolute value. It's just a proportion. But look at the fuel cost as a proportion of the overall cost that is incurred. So your initial capital expenditure is quite low. And then you, you spend quite a bit on expensive fuel later on. 
So you don't have the same cost that is associated with a coal plant where you have a lot of coal handling systems, a lot of ash handling system. Uh, you have a lot of uh, cooling uh, and all of that adds to your initial capital cost. Now you look at PV and obviously you have no fuel cost, right? That's a no brainer. The sun is your fuel. Your upfront investment cost though, is a significant proportion. And that I think is one of the reasons for the phenomenon that we see across the developing world. Now, uh, when, when Stephen Hawking wrote his book, A Short History of Time, he was told that for every equation that you insert in your book, you will have your leadership. <laughs> and, and he then uh, ended up uh, only inserting E equals MC squared. Uh, he said he couldn't write a book about physics without that. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into this equation in detail, but what it shows you, and this is one of the criticisms against the levelized cost comparison is that there are an enormous amount of variables that go into it. If you use levelized cost in the same jurisdiction, though, it starts to make some sense for policymakers, for decision makers, to decide in principle where to allocate their money. So Lazard, a major investment bank in Britain, they come up with this great presentation, which I encourage you to, to read. Um, Every year, they publish their updated levelized cost of electricity. And what they what they've calculated is uh, over time, you can see how the cost of renewable energy has decreased enormously. Uh, th this is this is phenomenal. Um, and the, the learning curve that you've seen, particularly for wind and solar, uh, is as a result of the relative lack of maturity of these technologies. So those of you familiar with microprocessors will know Moore's law. Moore's law says that the speed of a microprocessor doubles every 18 months, and it, its cost halves every 18 months. And that ratio has held true pretty much uh, since... 1980s, thereabouts. So it's been a remarkably steep learning curve. Now, there's a similar law that applies to solar panels, and it's called Wright's Law. And Wright's Law also has held true, uh, reducing over 10 years the cost of PV by 89%. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a staggering number. Um, onshore wind has also dropped very considerably. Uh, look at gas, combined cycle gas, that's come down a lot, due mostly uh, to lower cost of gas. Um, and again, shale gas has really made a major difference there. Remember those five graphs with the high contribution from fuel? So the cost of fuel has made a major difference there. Uh, some efficiency improvements, granted, um, a combined cycle gas turbine is highly efficient. It gets to about 65-66% efficiency compared to an ultra-supercritical coal plant, which only can manage about 35-36% efficiency. The rest is wasted. Uh, and the likelihood of anything happening in the coal space is zero because you can see that flat line. It's a mature technology. Every opportunity for optimization has been exhausted. So if you now look at this low uh, cost of PV panels, and you look at where solar resources are located in the world, you, you say, look, you know, this is a no-brainer. Africa should be rolling out solar panels across the entire continent. It should be covering the continent in PV panels. This is just absolute sense. But what happens in practice? So this is renewable penetration, sun and wind. And you can see that in Africa, it's exactly the inverse of what you would expect based on solar radiation and based on cost. Now, why is that? Because, I mean, is it because Africans can't afford it? Or what's, what's 
driving this particular dynamic. So I've thought about this a bit. Uh, and I, again, I don't claim to have the answer, but I can certainly point at uh, some of the issues. Uh, and, and, and here's a nice scholarly article uh, waiting for someone to write. <laughs> if you look at the cost of a climate project, the capital cost um, of the cost of capital for a climate project, then you can see that um, the more sunshine you get, the higher your capital cost becomes. Uh, and it's a strange correlation, but it's a correlation that typically holds true because the weighted average cost of capital that, that is applicable to climate projects in developing countries is significantly higher than the cost of rolling out these projects in developed countries. So the country in the world with the highest per capita penetration of solar panels, any guesses from the audience? It's the Netherlands. Now, I come, my, my ancestry is Dutch and I lived there for a while. And I can tell you, if there's one country in the world that does not receive blessings from above in the form of sunshine, it's the Netherlands. It's rainy, it's cloudy, it's gray. So we are seeing a completely counterintuitive behavior from investors when it comes to the rollout of this amazingly affordable new technology. So please, someone um, as as a as a MBA thesis, you can you can write this thing about the, the correlation between sunshine and cost of capital. There's a there's a story there. Somebody just wants to tell it. So then I started thinking about the, the shape of the cash flow curve and how that impacts the levelized cost of electricity. The green is PV. Obviously, this is just illustrative. And the black is for a natural gas plant. And because your upfront capital cost for a PV plant is all right at the front end, where you have a low weighted average cost of capital, it doesn't particularly matter so much because the discounting of cash flows in later years is not nearly as impactful uh, as it is in an environment where you have a high weighted average cost of capital or a high discount rate. So when a person, an investor in Africa looks at an energy project, he comes to a completely different answer than his counterparty sitting in Germany. The German investor looks at the project and discounts the cost of natural gas in the future at a rate of 8.5%. If you're sitting in Tanzania, you're discounting at a rate of 24-25% which means that your fuel costs in later years become far less impactful and far less compelling when comparing the levelized costs. So when you run the numbers, and I've built a little model to do this, the numbers turn out quite interesting. Uh, for a plant in a, a CCGT, combined cycle gas plant in Tanzania, uh, the levelized cost uh, is only 4.4% more expensive than, um, sorry, for a PV plant. It's only, um, let me just get my train of thought. Um, and so, yeah, 4.4% higher levelized cost in Tanzania than in Germany. But a, a PV plant is 23% more expensive. And you will remember from that picture that I showed about how close gas is to PV in a developed country with a low cost of capital. Immediately, it starts to make sense why Africa is not investing in PV technology as you would expect them to. So African investors are by no means um, as unsophisticated as some people would make them out to be. They know these things and they run the numbers and they say, 
if we want to develop our best bet is probably going to be something like natural gas. Now, this is not the story that we want to hear, right? This is not, we don't want Africa to embark on a fossil intense growth trajectory going forward. But in my engagements with uh, developmental financing institutions, DFIs with the World Bank, the IMF and so forth, they become quite dogmatic. And they say, we exclude all fossil fuels. And that may be an appropriate way forward. But certain technologies require a constant and available electricity 24-7, in particular if you run heavy industry. So cement plants, fertilizer plants that are needed to grow your economy. Also for grid stability, you need a small percentage, probably around 10%, that is always available and is always dispatchable. The rest can be renewables, but you do need some fraction of your electricity supply that can be dispatched at will. Now, again, the, the IEA, they do some really interesting work. They calculated the total emissions from the developed world since 1890. That's the dark blue. And then they said, okay, Africa, you've, you've not been innocent. You've also emitted some. And that's that green sliver. And that's predominantly South Africa. They we own up to that. But then they say, if Africa develops all the cement plants and fertilizer plants and all the combined cycle gas turbines that it requires to have grid stability, that little gray line on top, hard to see, that is the incremental emissions that will be put into the atmosphere if we allow Africa to develop. So the, the DFIs are very clever. They say, no, 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 but we've got cement factories. We've got fertilizer plants and we'll sell this to you. So please don't build your own. We will, we will sell it to you. Now, if you want to, if you want to grow and develop economies, you need industry. And the way in which developmental financing is applied at the moment is geared against not only the rollout of renewable energies, but also against the development of new industries. And that surely can't be a justifiable or appropriate outcome. So I want to end the talk tonight with a challenge to you. Uh, as you think about your careers, as you, whether you're an uh, engineer or an economist or an MBA student, uh, an environmental scientist, it doesn't particularly matter. What, are you, what can you do to solve this conundrum? Because if we, if we look at the, at the situation, the developing world accounts for two-thirds of the world's population but only one-fifth of the investment in clean energy. So there's a, there's a big disparity there. And if we don't figure out this financing solution, we will not be able to develop those global South countries without a high carbon trajectory, which we cannot afford. So we need to figure out how do we monetize the unutilized portion of the developing world's carbon budget in a way that does not lead to more carbon emissions. And I think the way to do this is by enabling carbon markets to grow at scale. What we've seen so far um, from the commitments made at Paris, 100 billion a year, when the ask is a trillion, it's a drop in the ocean. It's, it's not going to move the needle. If you look at the voluntary carbon market today, $1.9 billion per annum. It's, it's a rounding error on, an, on the hourly trade in global financial markets. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's the square root of nothing. <laughs> then you start looking at uh, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that have been announced. Uh, of which I was part of 
engineering the first one. That was $8.5 billion. The total, if you include uh, Vietnam, South Africa, Senegal, Indonesia, it comes to about $44 billion U.S. It's it minute, given the scale, the scale of the problem. So how do we unleash global financial markets in the same way that people buy cryptocurrency, which in my own opinion, is, I don't understand it, but it mm -hmm. seems to be based on a lot of hot air um, and certainly has a negative impact on the environment. How do we unleash that innovation and that new thinking around developing global financial markets to support what is certainly the most pressing issue facing our planet today, and that is solving the conundrum of climate change and energy poverty at the same time. So that's my challenge to you. I haven't figured it out, uh, and I'd love to hear from you what your thoughts are. Thank you very much. So happily, we do have a little bit of time for a question or two. Yep. And please say your name. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Shannon Chiso. I'm from Zimbabwe, so it's good to see you over. Um, my question to you is, first, I think over the last decade, we've seen China investing a lot within Africa in terms of like infrastructure as well as renewable energy and, and stuff like that. But I think there's been like a little bit like pushback among like locals because there's a lot of like investment from China and land from the rest of the world. Um, mainly for, for something that you've already mentioned, you know, like the lack of like credibility. How can we encourage other parts of the world to actually start investing in Africa without uh without like limiting it to something like grants and stuff like that that actually is not making any impact? I think the answer is profit. Profit. Um, and profit, unfortunately, in environmental circles is a bit of a dirty word. Uh, and and with, with due respect, um, I think many of the people attending climate negotiations represent <clears throat> environmental science, uh, NGOs, governments, but business is largely absent. And business needs to identify methods to, to monetize this. And Zimbabwe is a great example of where carbon markets have gone wrong, right? There was a, a major issue with the Kariba forest uh, where it sounded, and I don't want to make accusations, but it sounded fairly dodgy what happened there. Uh, but if we can roll that out on scale and have um, business getting involved where people are incentivized by, by profit, if they don't, if they're not going to make money, they're not going to engage in this market. It's, it's, that's that's how people are. Um, to quote Adam Smith, it's not with the benevolence of the the baker, the brewer, and the butcher that we owe our dinner. It's to their enlightened self-interest, and that's that's what we need to get. Um, it can't be a geopolitical power game where you go around with a begging bowl and see who gives you the most money. It is politically simply not going to happen. It that won't solve the problem, even if. China rolls out all the projects, it still won't make a bit. Other questions? Hi, I'm Claire, I'm an MBA student at Tuck. Um, my question is related to subsidies. So um, going back to the graph which showed like, the cost of various forms of energy over time, I think that one of the main reasons the cost. Maybe can you wait to respond on it, Claire? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the online audience can't hear without the uh, microphone. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'm Claire. I'm an MBA student. Um, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really close. Um, my question is related to subsidies. So I know that part of the reason, at least in the developed world, that the that solar has been so widely adopted is because it's been heavily subsidized. Um, but then I know that on the flip side, in a lot of developing countries, it's still petrol and diesel and coal that are heavily subsidized. So obviously, removing those subsidies, we've seen this slide in Nigeria. Like it, it's not an easy thing to do. 
Um, so if the answer that you can continue to subsidize renewable resources in Africa to encourage adoption, or is that just kind of creating a whole other issue where you know you want them to maybe switch to wind, but they're still stuck on solar because it's most heavily subsidized? Like, should subsidies be part of the transition equation? I think first of all, let's 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 just say that subsidies um, are also applicable to fossil fuels today, and in particular, the fact that fossil fuels um, aren't tax on the externalities that they impose on the environment. Uh, again, the IEA uh, has calculated that there's about. Uh, $7.2 trillion per annum that goes into subsidies, implicit and explicit, to the fossil fuel industry, uh, of which only 1.2 would be explicit. The rest is, is implicit because the crude cost of carbon emissions is not attributed to the fossil value chain. So, why do I mention that? I mention that because if those subsidies are simply abolish it. Then the current technology um, and the cost of that technology is sufficiently mature already that renewables can compete on its own. I don't think further subsidization is required in order to enable the role of renewables in developing countries where changes are required is in the cost of financing, because that is what is killing uh, the role of the renewable energy at the moment. The way in which these projects are funded simply make it impossible because of the high weight of average cost of capital. Um, subsidies, of course, are very interesting and very topical um, with IRA. Um, and I think what is uh, what I'm concerned about always is when you have a bureaucrat picking winners in terms of technologies. Uh, that doesn't always work out so well. And when I look at the amount of money that is being thrown at, for example, green hydrogen, I'm a, I'm a bit of a skeptic when I look at the economics of it. Um, I think we've got to be very cautious with the subsidies that we that we host up and rather allow um, market mechanisms to allocate capital efficiently. Uh, the market's a fantastically efficient instrument at, at doing exactly that. But removing those barriers, particularly the cost of capital, would be, would be a better source. Thank you. Um, thank you for your fabulous insights, and I think the point about the cost of capital is an absolutely, absolutely crucial one. And, and um, I hate to sound... Um, somewhat pessimistic, but I think it's a real politic of the whole thing that I don't think the cost of capital problem in these countries, I'm including a lot of the emerging market uh, countries in that is going to be easily solved, especially when you add and your point about the upfront nature of costs, the investment costs, you know, make it even if it could be solved with it, I mean, to some extent, it's a bigger problem. And that is not even including the cost of storage, which is which even adds to the further upfront costs with those new sources. I, I'm very skeptical that uh, it will be solved. And because the source of the of different kinds of risks, such as things that you mentioned, governance risks and political risks, and there are all kinds of you know, terrorism risks in some of the places. Um, and I really think it's time for the conversation to flip the script a little bit and say, you know, the, the climate doomers and gloomers perhaps need to chill a bit, unfold. I mean, 1.3 billion people, I mean, like for example, it's 18% of the world's population, consume 4% of the world's fertilizer, excuse me, but you know, maybe go on about, you know, get to your net zero targets, et cetera, but leave countries in places like Africa alone, help them maybe more with capacity building, governance, you know, get, there are lots of other things that can be collaterally done, but I I am really skeptical that in the scale that is required, that intermittent sources of energy, of which solar and wind is the only reasonable ones, uh, will ever be low cost of capital sources of energy for Africa. Right. I think I think those are very valid observations, and and, and you raise a couple of very interesting uh, 
points. If you look at the uh, ratings agencies and the credit ratings that they afford to developing countries, and you compare that to the actual defaults that take place, then the, the credit ratings agencies are, appear to be unduly pessimistic when it comes to the credit rating, which of course translates into a higher cost of capital. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of the financial architecture that needs to be interrogated uh, and investigated. I won't make a categorical statement that it's all due to the ratings agency. That's, that's hardly simplistic, but it certainly has a role to play in reducing the perceived risk, which not often is the real risk. So I think that's, that's that one part of reducing that um, whatever average cost of capital. But as I, as I went to COP in Dubai, I couldn't help but think of what somebody from Senegal would think. Senegal's got natural gas, but Senegal cannot get money from its former colonial parent, uh, France, because France won't fund fossil projects. So as this person, this delegate from Senegal, walks through the streets of Dubai, now I'm no fan of Dubai, but if this hypothetical Senegalese walks through Dubai and sees the, the skyscrapers hovering through the fog and filthy air, which there's a lot of in Dubai, what would that Senegalese think? He would say, you know, why can't we also follow this growth path? Because Dubai, 30 years ago, was, was nothing. And it rose to this economic primacy through natural gas. But Senegal can't go and borrow money to grow its economy because of these prescripts. So should climate activists chill, chill being the operative word, you know, uh, a warm environment? Uh, well, maybe, maybe. Uh, but I think that a more pragmatic approach certainly is indicated. If you look at that graph about incremental emissions from Africa, if African gas reserves are developed, there's a moral argument to be made there about allowing some leeway for developing countries while the current large emitters, including the US and Europe, uh, should do more and should do more of the hard yards in reducing their emissions. So I sort of agree with you, I think. <laughs> I think we'll take the last question over here. Oh, I should have introduced myself. I'm Anand Sundar, and I'm on the Tuck Finance yeah. faculty. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Claire, also at Tuck. Um, over the related question, have you seen any creative proposals put forward for either the ratings agencies or global finance institutions to rethink? How do they use the cost of capital to invest in projects? No. <laughs> um, if they are, I, I, I have not seen them. All of the investment banks have a climate practice or a climate department, but I'm not seeing the innovation coming out from those banks. I really don't. Uh, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but I think the answer lies in revisiting some of the um, and, and, and let me be a bit controversial, the dogma that is baked into carbon markets. So for example, the concept of additionality has been around since uh, Kyoto, but it was developed at a time when PV was much more expensive than fossil. Today, the world is different. Some measure of additionality probably should be applied, but should it be applied in exactly the same form as it was 30 years ago? The same with um, supplementarity, for example, the same with avoidance. Um, so I think many of these preconceived ideas that, that are, I mean, you should try in a lecture at the School of the Environment, um, question additionality, you get quite a, an, an, an aggressive response. Um, <laughs> But maybe it's time for us to, to relook at some of those assumptions in a way that does not lead to abuse, that does not lead to fraud. 
But if you look at the trillions of dollars that get traded across global financial markets uh, on, a, on a daily basis with essentially minimal fraud, then surely we can replicate this. This, this cannot be beyond uh, our ability to figure out. But we are we are stuck in in a thinking rut, and that's again the challenge to you, clever people in the room. Figure this out, and you will not only save the planet, but also become very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> so you've given a charge. Yes. And is. we have very bright people in the room, and I think you've heard the charge. And I would actually extend that to governance challenges finance charges, technological deployment, and all with an eye toward the impacts that we have with these systems and toward making them equitable. I think we've heard a lot about that today. So I'd just like to thank our speaker very, very much.